Hello, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thanks for watching another video on history of leaders of thought. Today we will be doing Nicholas Copernicus and Tycho Brahe. So starting with Nicholas Copernicus because he came prior chronologically, so he is considered the one who sparked the Copernican Revolution, which was essentially a shift towards a heliocentric model, which he was essentially the inventor of. Previously there was somebody known as Aristarchus who came up with a heliocentric model however that is a model where the sun is at the center of our solar system or at that point the center of the universe however the he was Copernicus's model was completely independent of Aristarchus and actually much more backed by science so I think we can give him almost the full credit for coming up with a heliocentric model he was he born in Prussia and he also died in Prussia. He's considered a both a polymath, meaning he was gifted across many different fields, but he's also a polyglot. He was fluent in a wide variety of languages. He studied canon law, which is a religious authority, which is might in I guess today's lens seem as a little bit um counterintuitive to be both a scientist and a one who follows um, religious law, but that was the case, at least for him and at the time. He also studied, as mentioned, mathematics, astronomy, physics, classics. Uh, he was a translator, a governor, and a, also, very notably, a an important economist, where he came up with the quantity theory of money, which I will also discuss, or Gresham's Law. So he was born to start, I guess we'll start with his life as I usually do. He was born in Tarun or Thorn, which is in Royal Prussia in modern day Poland. The town is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so you can actually go and check it out. The whole city is protected, so you can't bulldoze those buildings and put in skyscrapers, at least with current building codes, or at least as protected by international law. Here's Copernicus's house, which you can still visit. Obviously a very beautiful looking building. So as you can probably tell his father was a wealthy merchant merchant from Krakow which is the capital of Poland and his mother also came from a wealthy merchant family from this town he was born in Thorn or Tarun he was the youngest of four children so two of his older um, siblings went into church life one became a nun one became an Augustinian canon one um one died and left him five children to take care of so obviously a little bit of a burden for somebody or well, not necessarily a burden but i think it should be taken into account the fact that he had to care for someone else's kids but um nonetheless he did he ended up following somewhat of a similar path to that of his siblings it seemed as though his family despite coming from a merchant background were all sort of geared towards religious life he had no wives or children. He did supposedly have a scandal with one of his housemaids. The Bishop of Warren sort of really criticized him for this because obviously the upper class not only should not be having um, affairs or relationships with those of a lower class, but also to have one's housemaid would have been even considered more of a scandal. So his parents were involved in the Thirteen Years' War, which is a war between the Prussian cities, essentially, and the Teuton Order, which is a order that originated in Jerusalem, but they had Catholic um, roots. He spoke Latin, German, and Polish supposedly equally. However, he did most of his writing in Latin, which was common for the time, or especially common for any sort of intellectual pursuits. He also spoke Greek and Italian, and even Hebrew, a little bit of Hebrew, but those languages maybe a little less so. So in that regards, he spoke essentially six languages, which would quantify one as a polyglot. Um, at one point, where he declared himself a uh, natio germanum, which means his native tongue was German. Whether this is true or not, maybe his native tongue was actually perhaps Polish, it's hard to say, but he either did this for the special rights that were given to German citizens, or maybe he wanted to appear as more German, which would have not been a too strange idea at the time, but nonetheless, he declared at one point that German was his native tongue. 
in throughout his life he sort of he was kind of agnostic in terms of what people referred to him sometimes he would spell his last name differently sometimes he would just refer to himself as nicholas nicolai de turunia which just means nicholas son of nicolai of turunia because that's his family but i think he was sufficiently famous or sufficiently well known because of his important family background and his rise to success that i think his names were pretty much interchangeably and he could claim them sort of all in terms of his educational career so his he was educated mostly by his uncle on his mother's side who was an italian born humanist his name was lucas watson road robe the younger so he was the principal or the head of the saint john's school in Turun, or the headmaster so he studied there when he was quite young and then he went off to a cathedral school up the river which was sort of a preparatory school to go to the university of krakow which was also his uncle's alma mater the University of Krakow is now called Jagiellonian University. So at 18 years old, he leaves his preparatory school and goes with his brother to the Krakow University. His brother being older because he is the youngest brother, as mentioned earlier, previously. He studied in the Department of Arts, so he got exposed to many a wide variety of fields. But it was sort of what they call it the heyday of mathematics and astronomy for poland at the time so they were obviously a lot of innovations going in it must have been a very exciting place to be even for someone as ambitious as copernicus or perhaps especially for someone as ambitious as copernicus studied arithmetic geometry optics cosmography the uh, theoretical and computational astronomy he got familiar with aristotle and obviously averroes because averroes was as mentioned one of the ones who sort of more modernized it and through there as we'll see is sort of a theme one of the big struggles at the time was that aristotle sort of perceived a perfect universe so it didn't align with for example the um ellipses the um, oddly shaped spheres of the current geocentric model so it did not align with aristotle so he got familiar with aristotle but he also in private study studied euclid who wrote euclid's element Alphonsine and various others in his spare time and the classics as well and he started establishing this big and large library which was ultimately taken as war booty by the Swedes in the deluge campaigns in the night in the 1650s so um, I guess the takeaway there is that firstly he accumulated enough books to be worth stealing or rare enough books to be worth stealing but also he establish enough clout and fame to make it worth um, the Swedes prestige in terms of stealing it so at this time he there were kind of two theories going on as I kind of alluded to so there was Ptolemy's model where it was a, a geocentric model so that is one with the earth in the middle but they noticed so that there were variances because obviously the distances were not working because in fact the center is the Sun so they this they kind of accommodated this for this by coming up with ellipses not eclipses eclipses as i mentioned many times before is when the sun or the moon crosses over each other or vice versa whereas ellipses are sort of like oval like shapes so there was that theory and then there was aristotle's theory where everything had to be homospheric and everything had to be perfect so these two theories were obviously clashing very closely so he sort of spent most of his time in university struggling with this but ultimately he left without a degree in the university and he went to his uncle watson robe to who had just become prince bishop of warmia so he was going to join his court or the canonry and originally he was going to become join the canonry right away but supposedly there was maybe it was the opposition to his uncle or for some reason he couldn't get the position so they sent him off to italy specifically bologna to study an ecclesiastical career so two years later he ends up joining and he serves under his uncle as his um it is part of his canonry did he become a priest that's disputed some say he did some say he didn't but the point was i think is that he had a heavy religious background he studied to become a a canon or an ecclesiastical person so and i think that um i i, I think that's very rarely seen in today's society and i think even then it would have been 
uncommon to see as well. In Bologna, he was focusing on religion, so Bologna was where he was studying to work under his grandpa, under his uncle, pardon me. But he also studied the classics and astronomy, as mentioned previously, because that is his true passion. And supposedly he became familiar with Domenico Ferreira, who was a famous astronomer. But he also got introduced to medicine here. And ultimately he becomes, for his uncle, both secretary and physician. But ultimately he ends up running everything for his uncle. He also becomes the economist and whatnot. But he he started incorporating astrology or he sorry he did not like the concept of astrology and this was something that differs quite a bit from bra so astrology is essentially um giving like horoscopes or attributing certain um meaning to the uh, cosmos whereas astronomy is more of a just a I guess one is more descriptive and one is more instructive, whereas astrology is more instructive and astronomy is more descriptive. So in terms of planetary observations, one I'd like to specifically reference is he observed Mercury three times and he was off by minus three, minus 15, and minus one arc minutes, which is obviously pretty close. Uh, he observed Mars many times, two degrees, 20 times, 77 times. Uh, these are, sorry, arc minutes and 137. Venus minus 24 and Jupiter 38, 51 minus 11 and 25. So those obviously just sound like a bunch of numbers. But what I noticed from these was that Mercury and Venus, he was off by solely negative figures in terms of arc minutes. Whereas those such as Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, with the exception of just two, um, two data points, he was always positive. So it seems as though for those planets that are closer to the sun, he was underestimating it. And for those that are further from the sun, he was overestimating that. So I think that obviously had to do something with um, the calculations. I, that's what I perceive, and I think that makes quite a bit of sense to me. So he makes these observances, and at 30, he goes back to Warmia, and pretty much to serve under his uncle, and he stays there for pretty much 40 years he ends up going to Fromborg, which is also in prussia as well but he pretty much spends the rest of his life in sort of a, um, an actual less a research role but a more operational role, role under his uncle so he's technically secretary and physician but he also covers economic duties and he pretty much does everything but he's notably maybe more maybe because his uncle and his family had that background but he was always more loyal to the Pro polish crown than to the teutonic order this time he also worth noting that he wrote 85 poems or epistles they're called where he um, comments on a lot of greek questions namely those regarding the the issues with some of aristotle's beliefs but also even as far as plutarch who is one of my favorite biographers of all time as well so i guess since we're here, I think it would be a good time to talk about the quantity theory of money. So he was working, obviously, under his his uncle, and they were having some... Um, th they needed monetary reform and also religious reform as well. So he came up with this quantity theory of money, which is quite simple, actually. It's just there's a, a correlation between the price of goods and the quantity of money in circulation, which I think... well. I think it's obviously true because uh, any 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 object, object has a relative, relative value, value, right? So, so even if yeah, if there's only a hundred dollars, they divide up a hundred dollars into whatever. So that is true. It got um I I completely believe it to be true, but it's been contested over the time. Uh, Keynesian economics disagrees with it in some sense. But I don't think it disagrees that it's true. I think Keynesian economics disagrees in how it actually solves problems. Whereas monetid, mo, um, the monetists who believe in just changing the, the money supply to fix economic problems um, pretty much fully align with Copernicus's belief here. So this is obviously, I think, a very intuitive idea, but he was the first to name it, and obviously it has a lot of real-world implication. It might even have more real-world implications today than the he, uh, heliocentric model in terms of actual 
day-to-day -day life. Obviously, it's great to know that the sun's the center of the the solar system, but you know, if we're in an economic depression, how do we solve this? Perhaps you know, changing the quantity of money, or we go into Keynesian economics as well, which would be monetary and fiscal policy. But nonetheless, I think it just once again proves that he's such a polymath and was able to uh, contribute to many different fields. His um, many of his friends at this time started switching to Protestantism, but he was sort of not interested. Um, I think this is not just because he was or because he was opposed to Protestantism, I think it's because he was starting to get just a little less interested in or fascinated in religion. He was kind of thrust into religion, but his real passion was astronomy. He has this quote, he says, some people believe that it is excellent to correct to, and correct to work out things so absurd as did that Polish astronomer who moves earth and stops the sun. Indeed, wise rulers should have curbed such light-mindedness. So that was a quote by Melanchthon. Melanchthon. It's got a CH in there. But um, basically, he's criticizing Copernicus, saying that you know he is firstly making these big sweeping statements, such as um, the Earth is moving and the Sun is staying still, which obviously, when put into words, sounds like a huge thing to claim. But also, he thinks he's missing the point by neglecting religion. And this individual goes so far as to say that government authorities should prevent people like Copernicus from focusing on this, and they should be focusing on other things such as ecclesiastical beliefs. But I think at this point, he was sort of changed his interest. Um, eight years later, he... Um, yeah, so in 1514, he creates what's called commentariolus, which means little commentaries, which he creates pretty much the heliocentric hypothesis, and he produced it only for his friends. He was really, um, and I think this is where it not only differs him from Tycho Brahe, who we'll discuss, but pretty much the vast majority of leaders of thought that we've discussed in that he did not want to publish it at all. In fact, he does not even publish it until his deathbed. So in 1532, he makes a revised and more explicit version called De Revolutionis nu De, De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, and his friends once again tried persuading him to publish it, um, but he was worried. He, why did he not publish it? Perhaps it was from religious ob uh, objections. Perhaps he was just not confident in his own beliefs. I think it's hard to say. I think it's because I he. I, th I think there were a, a variety of reasons. I think it's just because he wasn't sure, and I don't think he wanted his name to be attached to something that could be easily proven wrong. And it was such an... Um, even though he hadn't published the book, it was still starting to get a lot of popularity in, in Europe. People still knew who Copernicus was, despite him not having published the book. But I think, he, I think if anything, he feared that he was wrong. So... He there's a he, he lists heliocentric information. Um, there's obviously Tycho Brahe starts disputing this, but he's considered the first competent mind in astronomy. But um, I guess in terms of his, I, I guess we'll go to his death now. So at seven years old, he gets uh, up. Uh, poloplexy or paralysis so he pretty much just freezes out and on his deathbed he produces the first he is given the first printed copy of the revolutionibus orbium celestium and apparently he wakes up from his stroke looks at the book and he died peacefully so it was almost like is this true or not it's hard to say but the point was that it was kind of um like a, a nice ending to his life and that his life's work was the book and that it got produced and it, that's what l l allowed him to sleep in peace but i think that could be uh, disputed his first burial was kind of hack um he has, a lot of his organs are, or body parts were missing notably his jaw was missing but later he was buried again and he's on his tombstone is written the founder of heliocentric theory and church canon in the Fromberg Cathedral. 
So, I guess to talk a little bit about what the heliocentric model is, here's all the, the presuppositions that I'll, I'll mention here. So there is no center of all the celestial circles or spheres. So this is an interesting one because not only, so he says that the sun is the main center of the, um, the solar system, but this does not apply to everything. So there is no center to all spheres. So for example, um, he presupposes that perhaps, you know, there could be moons and such that circle other planets. So I think that's a very, very good one. Uh, the center of the earth is not the center of the universe, but only the center towards which heavily bodies move in the center of the lunar sphere. So only the moon, once again, kind of building on the first point, only the moon circles the earth, which is true as far as, as, far as I know. <laughs> all the spheres surround the sun as if it were the middle of them all, and therefore the center of the universe is near the sun. So he does not even imply that the universe is the center of the sun. He kind of extrapolates that maybe the sun could be circling something else, but he, um, obviously we're very far from the center of the universe, but um, he was getting there. The ratio of the Earth's distance from the sun to the height of the firmament, outermost celestial sphere, sphere containing the stars, is so much smaller than the ratio of the Earth's radius to the distance of the sun that the distance from the Earth to the sun is imperceptible to comparison with the height of the firmament. So this is just alluding to his con concept of how big the um, the solar system is, because obviously a lot of the previous mathematical figures, by a huge margin, underestimated how big a lot of these celestial bodies were. Whatever motion appears in the firmament arises not only not from any motion in the firmament, but from the Earth's motion. The Earth, together with this circumjunct elements, performs a complete rotation on a fixed poles in a daily motion with the firmament and the highest heaven abide unchanged. So that's basically the Earth rotates. So that is something that um, will contest something Tycho Brahe believes very directly. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll mention it now, but I'll get into it in more detail with Brahe. Brahe thought that the Earth was so big and heavy that it could not rotate, so we thought that all the skies and stuff rotated, so Copernicus believed that the Earth was rotating, which was right. Uh, what appears to us as motion on the sun arise not from its motion, but from the motion of Earth and our sphere, with which we revolve around the sun like any other planet. The Earth has then more than one motion. So, obviously the Earth circles the sun, and that's what we're observing, not the sun rotating around the Earth. And lastly, the apparent retrograde and direct motion of planet arises from their motion, but from the Earth's. The motion of the Earth alone, therefore, suffices to explain so many apparent equalities, inequalities in the heavens. So this just explains a lot of the issues they were running into mathematically, such as the ellipses and such. So I think, obviously, very beautiful. Um, we'll get into him more in the comparison, but I think it's, it's very very strange for someone to be so right but to be so unsure of themselves so as to not punish it, publish it within their own lifetime so i guess here are the um quotes to know what we know to know that we know what we know and to know that we do not know what we do not know that is true knowledge so i think that really um expands on the point i was just saying that he he knew he did not know that what he knew was right, so he did not perceive it as true knowledge, even though it in fact was right. So that just, I think, if anything, explains his character. So influenced by these advisors and this hope, I have at length allowed my friends to publish the work as they had long besought me to do so. So that's just kind of like at his um, sick bed where he finally decides to publish the book or the writing. Mathematics is written for a ma mathematician, is the last quote. And that's just kind of alluding to what I mentioned before, is that a lot of these, the ways that these people wrote, wrote in a way that was not accessible to other people. They kind of kept it in a closed circle. And I think there's no evidence of it, but I think what Copernicus means by this is that those who wrote about astronomy or those who created their observances should have written it for a broader audience to make 
um, if they actually cared about the academic career, if they actually wanted to push it forward, because just keeping it in a close community will not create any innovations. So that's, that's Copernicus. Copernicus. We'll get to him more in the comparison. So, so Tycho Bra or Tigo Otensen Bra. I think it was a pretty cool, cool name. Um, so, so he's considered the last naked eye astronomer because a lot of individuals switched to telescopes following him. He's also the creator of the Tychonic cosmological model. So obviously different from the, Coper uh, the heliocentric model, the Copernicus model. In fact, it was more wrong, but that does not mean that Bra does not deserve merit in its own right, which I'll explain. So he was a Danish nobleman. He's famous for astronomical and planetary observations. He was born in the Danish peninsula of Scania. He's an astronomer, astrologer, and alchemist. So that's where he differs from Copernicus on one specific note, is that he was also an astrologer. So he also had the sort of um, horoscope components. He was considered the first competent mind in the modern astronomy to feel ardently the passion for exact empirical fact. So it's said that his his findings were five times more accurate than his contemporaries. The He liked the geometric benefits of the Copernican system, but he also liked the philosophical benefits of the Ptolemaic system, in that he believed, as we'll see in this quote later, that um, it does not make sense for, uh, according to Holy, Holy Scripture, that the Earth is not the center of the world. And we'll all explain that very clearly. And so he kind of tried culminating these two, the Ptolemaic system and the Copernican system, into the, the uh, Tychonic cosmological model. His, the, his book De Nova Stella, or a piece of writing De Nova Stella, or On the New Star. So this actually was a good or direct opposition to Aristotle, who believed in beyond the moon. He thought that everything was kind of a static, unchanging heavens. He observed that firstly, this what he observed was not between the moon and earth, because a lot of the time it could have been observed as a, a comet, but he observed that it was beyond the moon, but it was actually a new star being formed. So he thought that that kind of disapproved Aristotle's perfect universe. King Frederick II, um, obviously very characteristic of a lot of these great thinkers, they need a sort of patron or sort of a sponsor. King Frederick II helped them get an estate on Havan, which is an island where he created the Uraniburg Research Institute and later the Shansberg Underground Research Institute. But kind of in terms of negative aspect of his character, on his on that island he sort of created, he was almost like a dictator on that island. He levied high taxes. There was about 50 families living there and he used them to you know build his castles, host his parties, and worked in much of um, kind of like a dictator in that regards. But later, um, to kind of almost maybe get him back, the da the Danish king Christian the Fourth, who's the descendant of Frederick the Second, um, ultimately sends him into exile. Um, but fortunately, once again, the Bohemian king or the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf the Second of Prague takes him in, and there he finishes his life as the official imperial astronomer, and takes on his student Johannes Kepler, who finds the three laws of planetary motion and I will go cover his life eventually as well too and he eventually dies from a, a burst bladder some thought maybe he was poisoned but um, we'll see why I think the other one is more likely but uh, perhaps it's mercury poison so I guess as usual we'll start very specifically into his life and then we'll go sort of into his ideas so he comes from both in terms of his direct descendants, the Bra family and the Beale family were very noble families in Denmark, but he also has uh, uh, blood from the Rudd family, the Troll family, the Ulfstand family, and the Rosenkrantz family. So he had uh, a huge, huge um, um, authority in society at the time. So Denmark's most influential families. His great, All of his great-grandfathers were members of the King's Privy Council, he was born in Nuxtorp Castle, which is about 8 kilometers north of Svavlov in Danish Scania. He is the oldest of 12 children, so only 8 survived. Well, actually, that's pretty good odds. I guess it had something to do with their wealth, but he was the oldest of 8 children. 
Uh, he actually had a twin who died before his oh, baptism, so he actually wrote an ode in Latin to his dead brother. So I think this is one point um, of comparison to bring up a little bit early, and that Copernicus was actually the youngest and Bra was the eldest. I do think it does, um, I guess, well, two things. I think for Bra it would have been more difficult to have taken a divergent or unique path. I think there's a certain responsibility for older children to sort of follow in the line of their parents, but they're also given a lot more advantages. So Copernicus being the youngest probably was at a bit of a disadvantage, but it did not prevent, at least in Copernicus's case, his ability to outshine his elder brother. And Bra, um, obviously, being the oldest, he definitely outshined his other siblings. One of his sisters actually became his first student, however. So at two, he was sent to his uncle Jorgen Bra. He was the only child of the well, eight who ultimately ended up living, who was sent. And he was pretty much traveled with Jorgen Bra, uh, castle to castle. And he said that Jorgen Bra raised me generously until my 18th year. He always treated me as his own son and heir. So why did this happen? I think it was just part of his education. I think they wanted him to be global. He was the eldest child. He had a lot of um, family names he represented. And I just, I think Jorgen Bra was, had no children of his own and thought, it would be a good optimal experience for him. From 6 to 12, he attends this Latin school, and at age of 12, he goes to University of Copenhagen. He, his uncle wanted him to study law, but obviously he was more fascinated in astronomy. He, there was a solar eclipse on the 21st of August, 18, uh, sorry, uh, 1560, and there, this obviously was the firstly he was fascinated because it was actually predicted it was a day off so he thought it was fascinating that such an amazing phenomenon could be predicted but he also realized that there was a gap in that it was predicted a whole day off so he realized there's still a lot of low-hanging fruit still a lot of opportunities for him to create his own impact um in terms of so he also studied astrology and that's obviously where it differs from Copernicus. So he created these horoscopes associated with famous personalities a lot of this time. Um, but this is, he continued this also until he was older too. So it's not like it was just a youthful thing. I think it makes it, I, I used to not believe in any of this stuff until I was actually reading a, an article in a standardized test. And it proves that those who, at least in those who follow the Christmas, for example, who have birthdays in Decembers have for throughout their whole life particularly influential when they're younger they are more deprived of attention during their birth months because it contests with other holidays whereas i'm august a leo my birthday is like the the most important thing for like three months um so it's obviously i never had it contested there so i'm like if that is true maybe then other things apply too maybe there's for example um i don't know you're born in the spring Things are getting hot when you're just starting to, I don't know, develop could have an implication. So I think there is some truth, but I don't think it should be followed too closely. But I also think it just makes studying, at least at the time, it made a str studying astronomy a lot more meaningful. Because if it's solely just observance and it's solely just descriptive, it can become dry. But if you get into actual what's the meaning behind it, like what it, obviously there are the stars up there, but what does it mean, I think whether it's true or not it helps i guess to motivate people and to inspire people like for for example would um would the earliest people who ever who started gazing up at the stars have done so if they did not you know perceive them as gods or have any sort of respect for them it probably would have just been a lost art otherwise so his uncle participated in denmark's war with sweden and um Apparently, he'd ended up dying of pneumonia because Frederick II, who was the, the king of Denmark, jumped into the river and his uncle jump, Jorgen jumped in after him and he got pneumonia. They were both drunk, so supposedly he died. And um, obviously, a, a sad event for Bra because his uncle was a very influential figure for him. Following that, he goes to the University of Rostock 
And uh, cool, I think this is a very important anecdote. Um, so his third cousin, who is a Danish noble, or uh, his name was Manderup Parsberg. They were having a, a, a drunken quarrel or argument um, at one of their professor's houses at, about a mathematician. And they eventually can't really sort it out, so they decide to duel it out. And they decide to duel it out, have a sword duel in the dark. So for such a great astronomer, not a smartest idea, I think it could be one of the, uh, the dumbest. Like, I don't even think it would be good to fight a punching bag in the dark with a sword. But either way, he loses part of his nose and gets a big scar on his head. So his nose, probably in this image, is designed to be fake. Fortunately, the university helps him get a new nose, which he carries for the rest of his life. They thought that the nose was gold or was said to be gold or silver, but when they actually checked the body, it was actually made of copper. But I don't. I think that's a sort of minute detail. I think what's more important was the his character and how uh, boisterous he was and willing to fight. And that's where he very much differs from Copernicus, whereas Copernicus didn't even want to share his idea Bra specifically was looking for a fight, and he, he actually picked Copernicus as a good one to fight. So that's a very important distinction between the two. So obviously his parents wanted him to study law or politics, and that was even the wish of his uncle, who had unfortunately died, but they allowed him to pursue his passion. I think it's because he proved to be sufficiently talented at it, but also I think they were sufficiently wealthy enough to allow him to do so. He becomes a canon at the Cathedral of Roskilde, Roskilde, but it's mostly just a ceremonial role. Obviously, I think he had uh, both Copernicus and Brawl had a heavy religious influence on them, but I think compared to their contemporaries, they were less into it than perhaps the rest of their family. Falls in love with this girl called, or woman called, Kristen Hansen. Her father was a Lutheran minister, but she was a commoner, so her her family his family did not support him marrying her and most specifically the nobility could not marry the commoners unless they had a special arrangement where they had to live together for three years but then even then their children would not have carry their father's name or any of their rights or any of the nobility but he nonetheless married this this woman out of love and frederick the second actually ended up respecting this despite his family not respecting it frederick the second supposedly was deprived of his own love because he had to he had to marry for status and he uh, he respected bra in you know doing following his passions and i think that's really characteristic of bra bra is willing to fight but also willing to give up well the status of his children for love and that's just I think very characteristic of him. There's a big fire in his soul. So uh, he has eight children with this woman. Um, six survived till adulthood, and one died of the plague. But they've pretty much followed him his whole life, even into exile. They live in Havan, the island, with him, and they're always loving and supportive. So, so as mentioned, he created this book or piece of writing called the Nova Stellar, which means a new star in so in 1572 he observed a supernova so he noticed that there was no daily parallax on this observance so it had to be beyond the parallax later it was found to be 75 7500 light years but it was sort of something that first started contesting a lot of aristotelian beliefs and yeah, so he creates his first observatory in Herivard Abbey, and in 1574 he actually publishes this book, De Nova Stellar, and yeah, he starts getting a little bit of fame for this. He takes on his first student, who's actually his younger sister, Sophie, and he travels around to Frankfurt, um, Venice, and um, Brussels. For the for searching for Frederick the King, the Danish King. So basically, he was looking for contractors and craftsmen and artisans. Um, basically, just doing sort of a side jobs to, for his loyalty to the king, while also pursuing his own sort of passions. So the Danish King obviously was very fond of him. He really liked it, and he thought he should give Tycho a gift for both just because of his own family, because he deserved like by birthright deserved it but also just because he i think he admired him he admired him as someone who was um 
stuck up for himself, someone who is impassioned by love, but also someone who would do work for him. So he offers him many lordships of military and economically important estates, but he said he wanted to focus on science. He said in this quote, I do not want to take possession of any of the castles our benevolent king so graciously offered me. I am displeased with our society here, customary forms, and the whole rubbish. So he respects the king, obviously, as he mentions, our benevolent king so graciously offered me, but he wants to get out here and he wants to sort of be in the cosmos. So eventually he decides the, they, the, the, the king offers him an island of Haven, H-V-E-N, kind of sounds like heaven, and I guess it supposedly was for Bra. Um, it was a small island where 50 families lived, but he got full control. He got into, so they sort of took him to court because he started taxing them so much so he could build his observatories, but he was found um, not found guilty because probably he had so much political power anyways. But he created his first, um, well, not his first, I guess technically at the Abbey, but he creates a observatory called Uraniburg, which is named after Urania, which is a muse of astronomy. So basically this island, it wasn't even built for military or economic purposes. It was built almost like a, kind of like a church style. He was really in, in the essence of muses and such. In 1577, he observes the Great Comet, and once again, anti-Aristotelian, um, he observed that, you know, there's the cosmos change beyond the moon, which would have, Aristotle believed in something a perfect cosmos so he was starting to see okay that at least the aristotelian beliefs aren't right so then i think it's that's when he started picking at copernicus because copernicus would have been the next rational or the next um most popular belief or maybe even copernicus was the most popular model at the time i think technically most people still follow ptolemy and then followed by that maybe half and half the rest of the people supported either Aristotle or the Copernican model, the heliocentric model. So going back to sort of his astrology, they thought that these comets would be a sign of something. So he actually said that this, the comet, the great comet of 1577 was predicting bloodshed and violence. And they said that Ivan the Terrible, his actions were the cause of this or the result of this great comet. So. I don't think this stuff is true, but I think it also, he, he needed it for getting publicity because this is something that a lot of people could understand. They saw, oh, Tycho, Tycho said there will be violence and then Ivan the Terrible comes. So that also helps him with his fame and publicity. But um, I don't think there's any connection between the two events. But his, Frederick II was so fond of him, supposedly he was getting 1% of the entire Danish budget to his facility on these islands. He, um, he, and he was holding these lavish parties there as well. Obviously, he had lots of 50 families worth of servants. He had this pet elk, and I, I, I don't know why this story is so famous, but I'll tell it, and maybe I'll try to derive why the story keeps getting told. But he had this elk. And he was, he was asked by an individual, can this elk run faster than a deer? It was a tamed elk, which he would have at his parties. And he said, no, no could, uh, none could. And then the individual asked to buy the, the elk, and he was going to buy the elk. But the elk supposedly drank so much beer at one of the parties and fell down the stairs. So I guess the, the reason why this story is supposed to be told sort of as a joke, I think it's just um, to kind of um, an anecdote for how crazy the lifestyle must have been at the party if the elk is even having so access to enough beer to get drunk and fall downstairs you can only imagine what these parties are like what the humans are getting so uh, with that he's technically the royal astrologer of for um king frederick and he was in terms of astrology once again sort of the horoscopes it was his job at each of the prince's birth to give a sort of prediction or horoscope based on the cosmos so kind of i i consider that to be pseudoscience but i find it still fascinating and important eventually frederick ii dies and christian the fourth becomes or is heir to the throne he's only 11 years old so there's this regency council uh, he's in charge of the the monarchy for eight years the head of the council Christen christopher volkendorf what uh, really disliked Bra, so he starts falling out of favor with the Danish monarchy. 
Eventually, um, Christian the Fourth proves to be one who prefers war over academia, and he starts seizing a lot of estates from a lot of wealthy families. And under, as he said, there were hearsays against the Lutheran Church, so it was already mentioned that Bra was not as fond of Protestantism, anyways. He obviously supported it just because that was kind of customary, but he obviously wasn't very uh, popular there. So eventually, he falls out and. He he gets um, gets sent out, but right before this, he starts producing a star catalog and catalogs a thousand stars. So obviously, he's still staying very busy and with greater accuracy than any of his contemporaries. Supposedly, five times more accurate than previously been done. So so eventually, he gets exiled, and uh, he writes elegy to Daria, where he sort of apologizes to. Um, Christian the fourth, but he isn't really even apologizing. He actually um, says that Christian the fourth was unappreciative of his genius. So once again, he's not he's not like our our Machiavelli or somebody like that. He's not just trying to please the monarch. He's he's he, I guess he's he, he's he sticks up for himself and he's willing to to say that the king was wrong. And especially that's not going to help him if he ever wants to return, which he doesn't. But ultimately, his talent is not does not go unrecognized. And Rudolf II, who's the Holy Roman Emperor from Prague, um, invites him to be the Imperial Court Astronomer. So he is brought over to Prague and his family. His whole family is treated like nobility. Even his um, wife, who was a commoner back in the amongst the Danes, was actually treated like nobility as well. So much better treatment there in Prague. Here he also meets Johannes Kepler, who is his assistant. His Johannes Kepler was a Copernican, and he thought that um, Bra was just being too simplistic in, in inverting the Earth and Sun, and he's ultimately considered the new Hipparchus. But either way, there's this individual named uh, Nicholas Ramirez, who also created a Giulio heliocentric model, a geo heliocentric model, which is what Bras is. It's a geo and heliocentric model, so they both have different figures, which I'll explain very clearly. But he considered this one um, uh, uh, guilty of plagiarism, so that's why I have not talked about that individual. And I think it's true. I think the grounds are true there. So, um, yeah. So at 54, he has his bladder infection, and 11 days later, he dies. Supposedly, when he got the bladder infection, he was at a banquet, and he refused to leave because he thought it was a breach of etiquette. So once again, um, if you're starting to get a feel for what these parties are like, there's obviously a lot of alcohol going around so much, even going to the elk. He's not even leaving, and often these are, end up in fights and duels in the dark, so these must be some pretty wild parties. Um... His dying wish is for Kepler to finish the Rudolphine Tables, which is obviously named for Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor. And he was hoping that he would use his own planetary system, but Kepler sort of betrays him and actually uses a Copernican model. It said the quote, he lived like a sage and died like a fool. So um, I guess that's kind of true because his dying wish was never really granted, as opposed to Copernicus's, who's deathbed was pretty much the inception of the Copernican revolution. Some say he might have died of mercury poison, so um, Christian, who was back at the Danish king, son of Frederick II, he supposedly, perhaps Tycho Brahe had an affair with his mother, and he was obviously very upset about this, so he gets Tycho Brahe's cousin, Eric Brahe, to poison him with mercury. That's I think it seems like a bit of a stretch. I, I think Bra was so in love with his commoner wife that I don't think he would have been having an affair with the mother of the king. Similarly, if he was having a mother uh, affair with the mother of the king, he'd probably have to be back in Denmark rather than in Prague. And similarly, he might have had a little bit more political power and might not have been exiled if he was having an affair with her. So I think that one's a little bit of a stretch. The other is possibly Kepler killed him so that he could have access to the lab and chemicals. I don't think this is this is true. I think Kepler, despite disagreeing with him, he really respected his teacher, Bra. 
but nonetheless, they checked his body and they found that there was a little bit of mercury in there, but it was just from his normal research from his labs, like it was normal exposure and it wasn't a small dosage exposure over a long time. And his nose was actually found not to be gold, but of copper. So um, just a sign of minute detail. So in terms of his actual work, so he used no telescopes. That's why he's considered the last naked eye astronomer. He improved the sextant and quadrant, which were um, devices for measuring various um, astrological, uh, astronomical um, things in the cosmos, for example. Here's a picture of the quadrant. So he, he made them more precise, and the reason why his uh, all of his figures were supposedly five times more accurate was he just started off by making them bigger. He just made bigger quadrants and bigger sextants. With 1% of the Danish budget, he obviously had the money to do so. So that's how he made it more accurate. Uh, he also, another thing he did was he built it underground. He realized that buildings would shift. So his second laboratory, he actually built underground. So even more accurate. In terms of math, there was he used the then new it's called prosthaphoresis um, algorithm, which is a way of approximating products um, using trigonometric identities. So you probably recognize the trigonometric identities from, I guess, uh, calculus AB or calculus BC if you've done those. But um, those eventually got replaced by log logarithmic proofs. But the point is that he was using the most modern forms of mathematics and the most the completely new pieces of hardware. So that's why his measurements were so much correct, more correct. And that was sort of his first job that he set himself to do. He realized, you know, he observed that first comment and he said, it's a whole day off. Like, if anything, I'd just like to get things more accurate. And that alone, I think, is an important contribution. So to the Tychonic cosmological model. So he respected Copernicus. Um, he was actually the first in Denmark to teach of the Copernican model or the heliocentric model, but he thought that it just didn't align with Aristotle's, um, which he thought was absolutely foundational and had to be um, aligned with a new model. He also saw that just a lot of Copernicus's data were so off, so inaccurate, it just couldn't be accepted as truth. You know, like there, it actually was right, but he just saw so many flaws with the, da the data. It was so error prone that he thought he might as well just make a new, a new model. So, how he has his model set up, his geoheliocentric model. So the planets orbit the sun. However, the moon and the sun orbit the Earth. So in effect, everything orbits the Earth, but the planets are orbiting the sun, which orbits the Earth. So pretty complicated model, but it's um, aligned with both observational and computational advantages. So it fit with the data they had at the time, but it also was pretty long lasting. So it, it um, accommodated for the phases of Venus, which were not um, explained until later with Galileo. So it was also long lasting as well. It was also easy to adopt for the, a lot of the heliosceptics because a lot of, the main reason why people had a difficulty with accepting the heliocentric model was that the Earth, just by definition, by all the religious texts they had read, by the any sort of Aristotle, even the pagans, they, the Earth was the center of the universe and consciousness was the center of the universe. So it just didn't make sense that for Copernicus to have put the sun there. So it was easy for the heliosceptics. And it didn't, so the, both the heliocentric and the geocentric model required transparent rotations of spheres. Um, however, his model didn't, so it seemed like a good fix. And um, uh, so Aristotle's heaven was created by either and quintessence, quintessence, pardon me, which is basically just nothing and lightness. And then he observed that as you get closer to the Earth, much as we've seen with previous philosophers, things get more dense and more material. So with that, he came to the conclusion that the Earth is heavy and sluggish, the heaviest and sluggish. So he thought of it as a lazy body. 
and he thought like it would be so it wouldn't make sense so for example when we see the sun rise and the sun set the earth is so heavy and slow it must be the sky moving not the earth moving obviously it was wrong um there's no wind resistance in space and there's nothing to really slow it down so um it's wrong as far as we know um but he thought yeah that's how we observed it the earth at the heaviest and everything rotates around it he also thought it uh, absurd to have these stars so massive so he thought like just by doing the calculations you were running based on the distances and such how are these stars so big compared to the earth it just doesn't align with the the divine will or that which was written so other things mars and suns so there were other um geo heliocentric models such as that of Wittich, Ursus, Roosten, etc. Um, some of the differences are that in his model, Mars and Sun's orbits intersect. And um, yeah, that's the, that's the main one. But most of the other helio slash geocentric models, as we have with Bra, were either considered plagiarism or just not, it's just not as important to talk about because they're just further uh, elaborations on something that was already, unfortunately, for Bra wrong. In medicine, he focused on empiricism and celestial bodies, so he also brought his astrology into medicine. He had a large herbal garden in Uraniburg, so he also could be considered a polymath, just like Copernicus. So, to move to the quote, so, Earth not being at the center of the solar system would be a violation to on not only of all physical truth, but also of authority of holy, of holy scripture, which ought to be paramount. So, just didn't it didn't fit with any of the text um such a fast motion could not belong to earth a body was very heavy and dense and opaque but rather belongs to the sky itself whose form and subtle and constant matter are better suited for perpetual motion however fast so as mentioned earlier the more heavenly the body the lighter or less dense he, he believed or most people believe at the time so it would be easier for them to rotate those who study the stars have God as a teacher. So that's what I just mentioned earlier. Like, there's a you can waste. There's a lot of ways. Like, you have a finite amount of time in this world, and I just I don't think it could be considered a waste to stare at the stars. Like, there's a lot of wasted times, but there's no waste of time staying at the at the stars. And but I guess a different way of taking this would those who study the stars have God for a teacher. That would be could be extrapolated into his beliefs in astrology so that you know if you study the stars it'll tell you how to live so, so that's uh, a different perspective, perspective on that which, which I, I think is actually the more um, direct meaning of that quote so, so mathematical truth prefers simple words since the language of truth is itself simple so this i think contrasts um copernicus's mathematics is written for a mathematician he think he actually likes the language of mathematics. He thinks that mathematics, the language, is simple and very explanatory and can be agreed upon, whereas Copernicus kind of thought that it was kind of restrictive and holding people back. And lastly, the mouse is wise, but the cat is wiser. Um, a short quote, but I think it really explains who Bra is as a person, in that he thought not only one must come up with great ideas, but one must also be willing to fight for it. And that's what I think he really was. So here's some of his drawings. Here's actually a drawing of the his model. Here's one of his laboratories. And uh, yeah. So in terms of comparison, I guess, firstly, similarity. They both came from quite powerful families. They were both, well, one, Copernicus, they wanted him to go into an ecclesiastical career or a, pretty much a legal career or political career. They wanted him to do pretty much contribute to in their society bra as well they wanted him to go into law or politics but bra being the eldest it was surprising that he was allowed to pursue his passions copernicus being the youngest it's it's no surprise that he got away with it um just because he obviously had a lot of i think the youngest child is usually allowed that's why i think it's more often than not like comedians for example or a lot of people in the arts are younger children just because they're they have a little bit more career freedom so there's that in terms of their 
Um, obviously, mathematics. I think Copernicus was less focused on the mathematics. He was more of a polymath. He was more of a people person. Um, whereas Bra believed more in the mathematics. But then again, he completely goes on the other side of the spectrum where he believes in astrology, which is not believed on math based on mathematics at all. Um, and I think the mo but the main comparison. Uh, I'm sorry if I've beaten this one to death. Is that Copernicus was, if anything, so um, avoided at all costs any sort of um, debate or argument that he didn't even publish his book until the day he died so he wouldn't have to deal with it whereas Bra was literally looking for a fight his whole life even if it was a fight in the dark with swords which is one that would be very hard to win and picking a fight with Copernicus and arguing against his model so yeah I suppose in normal circumstances I think Bra's character would be more beneficial for creating an idea or to uh, a public idea, but in this case, Copernicus just happened to be right. So, um, yeah, and I guess lastly, just in terms of religion, I think we're starting to pick at hairs here, but I think Bra was the more religious one in that even though Copernicus had a more successful and more important religious career, I think that Bra, the one of the main reasons why Bra was trying to create this model was to align it with the Holy Scriptures. Whereas Copernicus, I think when he created his model, he realized that it did not align with any of the Holy Scriptures or any of the Holy Texts. And that was one of the reasons why he didn't publish it. So that's that. So I hope you enjoyed this video on Copernicus and Bra. I hope you watch some of the ones I make in the future and perhaps some of the ones I've made in the past. Thanks so much. Bye.